I think if we look at a case like Texas, for instance, and if they say, hey, we want to stay the Lone Star State and never interconnect our grid, then we're going to be on the exact same page of saying, hey, you probably need a, a grid that's about 25% nuclear. The IEA and NEA seem to suggest that it needs to be sub 2000 to compete directly with renewables, but that might not be necessary if it's running as a peaker system in that other 20% bound. As much as I hate it, natural gas with carbon capture, uh, because that is technically something that will compete with nuclear, even with a carbon tax as high as $250 a ton, that's only adding an extra $5 a megawatt. At $5 in 2018, we would have saved uh, 10 to 15 gigawatts of nuclear. If you're giving me $70 per ton, uh, we're repowering and uprating a whole lot of nuclear. Mm -hmm. And we're taking every single plant and adding on another gigawatt. I'm not going to dance on Dee's grave. All right. Welcome one and all to the Minds of the Ecclesia debate edition. Nuclear energy, but at what cost? And with me, I have two awesome guests that would like to have a nice discussion on the cost of nuclear energy with us, Soyato and Dungeons and Deadlifts. Let's go ahead and give you guys an introduction, starting with Soyato. Hi, uh, my name's Soyadal, um, aka Carl Pauls. Uh, I am an employee in the nuclear industry, but I'm not going to be advocating for anything my company produces directly. <laughs> uh, it is, um, you know, I have to disclaim that I do not represent the official positions of Terra Power and other disclaimers. Um, beyond that, I produce a weekly podcast, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on Eco Modernist one here on YouTube and on my Twitch channel, Soyaddle, soyaddle.tv. Um, good enough. <laughs> awesome, glad to have you. And D&D. &D. Yeah, so uh, my name's uh, Dungeons, Deadlifts, and Decarbonization. Uh, I have a channel focused on Canadian politics and decarbonization. Uh, I try to stream uh, every Tuesday uh, at six mountain time. And um, yeah, I I care about cost optimization and decarbonization generally. So, all right. So let's start off. Um, what are your thoughts, Adel, in regards to that particular topic, the cost and decarbonization for nuclear energy? Um, cost. Oh boy. Sorry. I'm I'm still just barely setting up my. Uh my stream here. Uh, I, could I give my opening statement just a bit? Let's just have a little bit more chatter yeah. and, uh, and then we'll be in a good situation. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we, okay. can, uh, we, can, we can chat about some of those, uh, those items. Um, oh, you know what? I, I forgot, I forgot. Um, I was going to surprise concede the debate because we can power the entire world on the amount of spin that Democrats are putting on Joe Biden's resignation. Ooh. <laughs> oh, the memes, the memes have begun. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there's the memes. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is that, is that like an, an eternal uh, limitless power supply? Is that, is that what I got going? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe it is a water-powered liberal tier energy source. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy, okay. Uh, soy, soy, uh, successfully soyed. Um, but let me tweak one more thing before I go live. There we go. Title bar crop and the world powered program vehicle title. corp. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's predominantly, uh, Republican shareholders at this point, And it's, uh, looks like business is booming. Oof. Uh, oh, he went from cop mala to cope mala now? The memes just keep evolving <laughs> over time. Yeah. As things change. I don't like this. Okay, let's hope everything's working. Yeah, it's fun, fun as a Canadian just, just watching, except it's not at all. <laughs> I all mean, right. you're our murdery hat, or our war crimey hat, so... <laughs> I mean, push comes to shove. Anything that goes on bad down here, you guys got to deal with eventually. <laughs> and we'll be flooding your borders in little or no time. You'll be trying to build a wall. All right. So now we're live. Uh, I'm live, of course, on the Eco Modernist channel uh, on X.com and on Soyaddle, uh, both on Kick and. Oh, and I 
missed um key replace one of you has a very dark back could be me yeah there you go you you've just got you've got a great black uh lower crushed end on your on your colors here but um uh, what uh, what I've got going on is uh, my opening statement. So, I didn't time this. I'm sorry if I take too long. It's all good. Please take, take equal time. time. Uh, electricity is not a fuel. It is not trivially storable. Uh, treating financialization of energy markets as a panacea will lock in higher climate force temperatures because we will miss even our current late overshoot trajectory from the IPCC SR15. Uh, in other words, we're wimpy from the Popeye cartoon. I'm hungry for energy, not hamburgers. So I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a kilowatt today. Climate change means we want to decarbonize. That's your brand, right? Uh, but we also need to power 365 days or the people who need energy uh, will destroy our climate progress in the voting booth, if not more directly. Batteries give us minutes to hours of storage. Water cycles give some privileged places like Canada and Washington seasonal fluctuations, but those don't align with demand. Bigger storage projects don't scale to months. Only fuels do that. Turning electricity back into fuels throws away half of your money, which is why studies like your American Supergrid source rely on hydrogen. By the way, nuclear does hydrogen more efficiently. So I know you've come around a bit, uh, and you're close enough to the Lazard LCOE Plus for new nuclear being two to four times as expensive as wind. You know what? That's good enough to me because this shared Davis-Lewis Caldera 2018 paper shows us that deep penetration where wind is 75%, that's your best case, even with three times the storage you've costed in your scenarios, we need a large overbuild, meaning the value of your precious dollars falls after 60% renewal. That's with the region-wide supergrid costing billions, again, the Caldera paper. This is even before we get close to the real learning rate of nuclear which we see in places like China or the re recent Korean build near Abu Dhabi, that's Baraka. Uh, so just like the robot chicken version of the Wimpy video, it's Tuesday and the market wants its money. If we don't pay for 24 seven energy one way or another, the public, that's Popeye, is going to beat our ass until we give up. That means we'll be sucking fossil fuel dick thanks to the market. <laughs> All right, so where's the spinach in your argument? DD and D, what do you think? Um, yeah, do you want me to, uh, uh, I'll go with my, my opening statement and we can get into it. Um, but yeah, I'm largely here to, to argue that we should pursue a power system dominated by renewable energy systems, focusing on solar, wind, and hydro, um, to Soyado's dismay. Uh, <laughs> this system, uh, is only possible through the proliferation of battery storage systems of at least four hours and transmission capabilities of up to 3000 kilometers. I take this position because I see decarbonization as a cost optimization problem, with different energy systems as inputs to that problem, where cost is a stand-in for footprint, physical costs, and labor, and ideally carbon through a carbon tax. When you look at the data available of cost modeling, where you maximize stability and minimize consumer prices, then nuclear is typically ignored due to its high higher costs. Generally speaking, variable renewable energy systems with batteries and transmission can support 80 to 90% of our energy demands, but require additional backup for the last 10 to 20%. This can be supported through hydro, geothermal, natural gas with carbon capture, and nuclear power. But that share will be split between them. Overall, this leads me to acknowledge that modeling is imperfect, and there will certainly be cases where nuclear is going to thrive. But on the aggregate, I don't expect it to be more than 5% of global energy demand to be produced by nuclear, or approximately a doubling of the existing nuclear fleet, assuming we go to about 80,000 terawatt hours by 2050. But I'd happily change my position if nuclear became more cost competitive. We have to understand, though, that even if we strip away regulations that make nuclear difficult to build, it still needs significant cost decreases to compete with renewables today. And maybe I'm just a pessimist, but it feels like it's a little bit too little too late with the meteoric fall in renewable energy costs. I fully support nuclear as a potential solution and believe that we should reduce barriers to entry that plague the industry. If nuclear fails, I want it to fail in a fair fight, and I truly want nuclear to be successful. Adding another tool to the tool belt just helps fight climate change. But as of right now, I'm not sure it makes sense to prioritize. We have to make decisions today that will impact our future grid, and we can't do that on hope. We have technology right now to vastly decarbonize the grid and should pursue those. In the meantime, hopefully nuclear becomes competitive. But to me, speculating against technological advancements in renewable, en 
in renewable energy systems seems like a bit of a losing strategy. If this conversation was taking place in 2000, however, me and Carl would be on the exact same side. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. So well, I that two great opening statements. So Carl, is there anything in that statement that you would like to uh, take a shot at? Would it be the batteries, decarbonization? I, I mean, I'll, I'll double down on, it's great that you don't want to bet the farm on speculating on renewable trajectories. Uh, with that said, a lot of the sources you provide, uh, for instance, the, um, the what's it? The, I, I uh, the Appalachian group. Oh, no, no. I, I know that you're stepping away from sort of that cost of transition. I looked up, by the way, the cost of the, the Egesemi study. It cites a 2012 study for European uh, DC transfer, yep. which is a fairly short distance. It yeah. is from Europe to North Africa. Yeah, we, right? we, yeah we, we can talk about that. I'm happy to update that. Like, even if you update the numbers to about, and this is might get it a little bit too much into the weeds to the like fifteen hundred um dollars per kilowatt mile um uh which which i think we both cited those papers um the the number changes to about nine hundred um dollars per kilowatt kilometer and that the study that i provided you was about 650 uh which was an estimation for 2030. i don't think that's the worst in the world but even if we increase mm. it it would increase the levelized cost of transmission um uh, assuming somewhat proportionally to that, right? Here's the problem. This is a mega project, just like you like love to point out, it's a mega project like nuclear. And so of course a nuclear build, if that first one takes eight years, if it takes 15 years, mm -hmm. that is many, many years of financing costs before you start paying down the financing costs. Mm -hmm. Like Einstein said, interest is the greatest force in the world hmm. and so uh you know if if you have to build a 5000 mile transmission line not like a 500 mile as in the european case but 5 3 to 5000 miles of dc transmission just to open the gates to your intercontinental load balancing uh that's a lot of finance ahead of us and so this is why Okay, I am willing to accept that intercontinental DC transmission is a part of the future mix, but it is very risky to say, okay, we are going to certainly bet on this as a cornerstone of the solution. And studies like I know you're gonna you're gonna cringe, the Jacobson studies <laughs> always rely on things like intercontinental transmission, hydrogen. Uh, you know, free transmission, storage at no cost, no effluent leakage. It is a hard thing to say that, okay, we're not going to build nuclear because look at all these wonderful non-costed options that we have in front of us. It's, it's amazing what you can get when you have zero cost for some of these things. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we agree with that. I think um, uh, the more that we both looked at the Jacobson papers, the more annoyed I got. Um, as well um and i think you can you can certainly argue there's issues with like the the uh the, the lit modeling and things like that of uh some of the assumptions you you have to make because obviously we're making these grand assumptions about how we're going to decarbonize the planet as a whole and um i think if we look at a case like texas for instance and if they say hey we want to stay the lone star state and never interconnect our grid then we're going to be on the exact same page of saying, hey, you probably need a, a grid that's about 25% nuclear. Um, and again, this is where I get into the cost modeling perspective of like, okay, when you take the $950 um, dollar per kilowatt um, or kilometer kilowatt um, estimate and you, you um, I guess, pin that out across, across the nation, it seems to provide cost competitive solutions, especially because I think both of us agree that Nuclear probably won't be in the five thousand dollar per kilowatt range until twenty thirty five. You might push back on that a little bit. Um, I think obviously it's going to depend a huge amount on where the regulations go and uh, how quickly we can. Uh, the analogy that I've used before is nuclear kind of got shot in the leg, and then we said, "Okay, go do a hundred yard sprint." Uh, why aren't you succeeding? 
Uh, so once we can patch up that wound and, and put it into a fair fight, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope it, I hope it is successful because I think it is uh, a super useful system. But like I said, it kind of just depends on when it becomes cost competitive uh, versus the other systems. And we have to make those decisions right now. And um, right. yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where, I, yeah. I have no, no argument with that. Uh, and what I'm going to stake my next bet on is your concession that we probably need to maintain, at least maintain current nuclear, or hopefully double, maybe even a maybe even as low as a 50% increase. I think you might, would you be willing to say a 50% increase is kind of like the barest survival chance for the nuclear industry that we, and, and for decarbonization, let's, oh, let's be so, frank. Like, certainly, like, like I said, I, I think, I think doubling is, is probably what, what we need, right? Yeah, so, so how are we not going to get orders of magnitude of learning with France replacing their aging reactors, with the U.S. replacing our aging reactors, some of which are 60 years old, and some of them, like my local Columbia generating station, are getting an 80-year relationship. And so if we're replacing these plants, the 40 to 60 to 80-year-old plants, we need to start building, and we need to start building now. Mm -hmm. And so how are we not going to get some level of regulatory relief and some level of, you know, supply chain improvements and some level of learning. And, and I'll say that you can check out what I know about nuclear learning. I spoke at the Thorium Energy Alliance conference. I talked about what I do at work. I'm not going to talk about that here, but I, I have a great appreciation for exactly the complexity that arrives for licensing, uh, verifying the build and coordinating all of those things. In fact, my dad was a uh, project manager at Satsup. What wonderful project that unfortunately fell prey to, uh, you know, builder misfeasance and uh, governmental malfeasance, where Seattle decided to pull up stakes from their share in the last two builds in Washington. And this is the biggest problem the absolute worst problem that nuclear faces right now is an unreliable regulator. That is when politicians get involved and say, I love it, I like it, I don't, I'm hot, I'm cold. The private capital will not commit. And I think we saw that with the latest ANS, um, you know, the latest ANS brief where we had Microsoft and Meta and a lot of different people, and Google, I think, as well, talking about how they're going to get involved in in nuclear. And they were all very, very positive until it got to the point where they said, who's gonna, who's gonna put your money in first? Mm -hmm. So here's my pitch. Governments have to put money in first. Government bonds have to be involved. Municipal bonds have to be involved. There has to be uh, a consequence for politicians failing to correct mistakes in regulation. The politicians need to bleed or the industry is going nowhere. We have to actually be collaborative on this and let go of the anti-nuclear systems that were built up in the, the late 2010s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have any, any disagreements with that. Uh, I don't think I even wrote down any notes. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I, again, we're, we're going to agree a lot on these. Um, I guess it's, it's where are we putting our bets? Uh, because this is fundamentally right. betting on the future. And mm -hmm. um, I'm quite pessimistic on a lot of those, just based off history. Uh, you, you, you are, uh, I would argue, much more optimistic than I am, uh, being, being a little bit closer to it. But um, uh, like I said, I sure hope that happens. Uh, I guess in terms of learning rate, it really depends on what that learning rate is and, and what trajectory we can see. I don't know if we're going to expect the same as solar, just because solar seems um, particularly scalable in the way that it works, works with assembly lines, things like that. Um, so I don't see us hitting the 20% one, which I did the calculation on. It was like uh, 150 billion to get down to $2,000 kilowatt nuclear. That would be absolutely incredible. Um, I probably wouldn't uh, 
that's more like betting green on roulette than uh, black or red. <laughs> um, uh, and then we get into the like, okay, is it closer to 12% kind of like wind or is it closer to seven to 10%, which is kind of the higher end of the estimates that I've seen. Uh, you might push back on that. And then I guess when we look at the um, South Korean reactors, we did see dramatic decreases, but then it kind of flatlined around 2000 to $2,500 a kilowatt. Uh, and again, the IEA seems to um, the IEA and NEA seem to suggest that it needs to be sub 2000 to compete directly with renewables, but that might not be necessary if it's running as a peaker system in that other 20% bound. But if we're looking right. at that 20% or even 10 to 20% bound, then for me, it's like, um, how much is, you know, advanced geothermal, how much is hydro or hydro, how much is as much as I hate it, natural gas with carbon capture. Uh, because that is technically something that will compete with nuclear, though I don't, I'm still unconvinced that it will actually be successful. Um, but on the assumption that it is, which is aligned with some of the NREL estimates by 2035, that is a potential thing that it has to compete with, even with a carbon tax as high as $250 a ton, that's only adding an extra $5 a megawatt to these systems. Um, again, I'm not going to hang my hat on natural gas with carbon capture, but um, I think it still needs to be a bit part of the conversation because we ha already have the systems in place. So the, um, the brownfields adaptation of the existing systems would, could potentially make sense in the short term for decarbonization strategies because reducing 95% of your CO2 from a natural gas plant plus only running it as a peaker system is way better than what we're currently doing. So, Wow. So I got to say, wow, $250 a ton uh, for it, did I get that right for a carbon um, carbon tax? If if you have a ninety five percent carbon capture rate, so you're only uh, releasing five percent uh, of the the normal one. So that would be because uh, it's four hundred and forty tons of CO two per gigawatt hour uh, for for it. So you just uh, obviously five percent of that multiplied by two fifty. So do, does does gas with CCS need to go up to that? extraordinary level in order to become uh, cost you know, competition even. uh 70 dollars is for 90 percent 170 dollars uh is around 95 to 99 it starts to get exponential right because of um basically yeah <laughs> um uh, diffusion rates right so i mean i mean it, at at five dollars okay at five dollars in 2018 we would have saved uh 10 to 15 gigawatts of nuclear it and today uh if you're if you're taking every plant every plant in the west outside of germany if you're giving me 70 dollars per ton uh we're repowering and uprating a whole lot of nuclear mm -hmm. and we're taking every single plant and adding on another gigawatt and that that's sort of like just base prediction because you've already got an established workforce and supply chain uh, and so that's going to give you the best opportunity at learning rate and unfortunately we saw things with you know the anti-nuclear policy side that really impacted Vogel but yeah. Vogel is online now mm -hmm. and Vogel is producing energy so it's if if we continue if we sort of carbon copy Vogel right now now that it's online this is the time this is where we get into commitments and build schedules. And so I want to sort of challenge you, mm -hmm. you know, with this low but aggressive carbon tax, $70 per ton, how many actual gigawatts can you commit to per month in the West? I know China is doing two to five per week, supposedly, according to Jacobson, uh, like two see if he's crossing oh. his fingers oh, that, that's behind on, his back. That's on, that's on wind and solar, right? of like how right, much they're building right. per week. Uh, I mean, right. uh, we'd have to, like last year they did 300 gigawatts, right? Uh, and so- That's what his numbers are based on. Yeah. And, and so the, the corrected, and so he says six gigawatts per week, but corrected over time, it looks like a sustainable rate, more like two to three, mm -hmm. but to be slightly conservative. So, but the question isn't what can China do? China's got, you know, command capital, and all sorts of a wonderful import, uh, sorry, uh, w wonderful uh, export um, um, deficit. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. or profit, I should say. <laughs> uh, we have the ex we have the import um, deficit, uh, and so and and they have got super cheap labor, uh, which is mm -hmm. my next point. Uh, and so yes, China can do it. Can the West do it? Now to circle back on that cheap cost of labor, uh, your own Rocky Mountain Institute sources say that the cost of solar panels, solar capacity is going to fall drastically. But I went back and this was hidden in the sources I gave you. RMI themselves say, oh no, construction and labor costs are already 80% of installation costs. Mm -hmm. So if you're projecting just on the raw materials and the raw build and the things that roll off of the factory, great, you've, you've completely conceded the point because it's mostly labor cost now. Yeah, yeah I would, uh, I would probably look at uh, the NREL estimates, at least for, um, for solar. Um, on, on what they have, a lot of it is um, cost improvements on inverters, which isn't really the end of the world. We, that's the, there's a reason that we um, do, uh, do battery systems on the, um, the storage side, not the inverter side. Um, and that, like, that's where it trends. Um, the, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's on inverters, it's on um, uh, automation, it's on, um, and again, this is a place where I wouldn't necessarily hang my hat on, um, uh, uh, carbon fiber, which um, seems to do a fair bit of the heavy lifting by 2050. We'll see if that comes to fruition or not. Um, estimations mm -hmm. can only be so good. Uh, but I think, again, when we uh, compare nuclear to these systems, we have to uh, remember that uh, unless I'm mistaken, nuclear is broadly a steam engine, uh, unless there's a nuclear system that uh, isn't one that I'm unfamiliar with, um, <laughs> um, but uh, when we look at the input costs for those as well, I think it's important to compare it to natural gas and coal plants uh, at, as kind of a, uh, a, a thumb suck on what we would expect nuclear to be. Obviously, it's going to have higher safety requirements. You would probably argue some of them are too high, but uh, like I said, you're not going to win very many votes if you're saying nuclear one right. or nuclear costs have come down because we've uh, reduced safety requirements by 50%. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely wouldn't. I would say that we're going to bring the cost of safety down by modernizing it. And, and that is exactly what I feel that the industry is doing. Not yeah. just my employer, but other uh, many other outfits, many other firms are modernizing the safety case. We saw reform in the NRC following new scales um, you know, application costing them over a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I just learned recently there that they filed um, 14, there was, sorry, the NRC filed against new scale, 1400 requests for additional information. These are formal legal requests that new scale had to answer. Uh, the NRC page numbers go, um, go up to like five in the hundreds. It's like 500 pages of, of listing these. Uh, and, and so if, if you look at like a new advanced reactor, uh, that followed that permitting process, the next one is Hermes Kairos reactor. Uh, they currently have three requests for additional information filed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's not a decrease in safety. Uh, we're unraveling a bureaucratic system, which was designed to destroy our ability to build nuclear energy capacity in the West. Yeah, and and I'm gonna be gonna be right there with you, and and that that's why I think uh, the more that I looked at your references and my references, uh, and the fact that many of them were exactly the same, <laughs> um, uh, the 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 more that I that I figured uh, our disagreements would be um, not quibbling, but um, really a discussion of almost pessimism versus optimism, uh, one where. Um, I'll probably be unconvinced until um, we, we get some uh, some actual results, but I want those results to be there. Um, and, and I want to see what that trajectory looks yeah. like. And realistically, like we're making these cost estimations 10, 20 years in the future. We could get fusion, we could get advanced geothermal, we could get all of these things that just throw the results way out of whack. And uh, there's almost an argument to be made that 5% and 20% are within the soil same error bar, um, be it, um, on, on different ends. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't not accept that. Uh, but also I can say that your, your case is equally optimistic when it comes to solar. 
We see the cost of rooftop systems has plateaued. You know, it has come down the gentle slope uh, or the, the precipitous slope to a very, very gentle and rocky one. And we only have data, NREL only has data to 2022. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what the supply chain impact is going to look like, what the trade war impact is going to look like. Uh, and so the costs are going to probably not look so rosy in two years once the impact of supply chain COVID and, and tariffs have taken hold. But I will say, I am right there with you. And so why, and what I do in my day job is I am all in on this. Uh, I left the video games industry um, for something a little more, hopefully more stable. Uh, so unless we're going to like put a pause on this debate and come back in five years and see, oh, <laughs> batteries are now 1% uh, the cost that they were in 2024, or oh, nuclear is actually, actually it is, uh, you know, going to be very, very cheap. I can't, I can't like speculate on how cheap it might be after my project is done, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. These are things to be determined at a later date. Yeah, I, and yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, again, uh, I think there's, um, there's certainly an argument to be made that like, yeah, the trade war, the tariffs, the things like this will certainly hurt the renewable industry. Um, uh, and but then when we look to the batteries, it looks like there's a lot more onshoring for the American side. Um, things like iron air batteries, things like sodium ion batteries uh, that are coming out of uh, even France, um, they look to have um, or be able to have incremental changes in battery costs because batteries are generally um, uh, very similar. So we're seeing conversions of lithium ion plants into sodium ion plants, things like that, where you can. Um, uh, you can scale up uh, different systems and switch your chemistries. Uh, and so mm. that makes my chemical engineering heart uh, flutter uh, <laughs> when I see that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we, like we said, like you said, we're, we'll have to see in, in two to three years, realistically, where right. these things end up. Because if it, some of these... Well, you're not... But you're not going to see iron air batteries in two to three years at scale for... for, for you know, for big systems, you might see nickel man manganese cobalt. I literally, you know, Amazon Prime Day just passed, and I bought a nickel manganese cobalt battery system, which supposedly has ten to twenty times the number of cycles as a, a you know lithium ion battery. And that would be that would be a great long term cost reduction. It let us scale up battery storage, even though other storage like gravity or uh, you know either hydro or, or mm -hmm. weighted storage might be cheaper um but but yeah i i would love to see it happen uh it it's not enough you know it's not enough to make the argument that we can slow down whatever potential there is in new yeah uh, i i guess like probably where the biggest disagreement is is where those resources specifically go. So if you're expecting a system that is 70% renewables, then, or 80% or 90%, whatever we want to call it, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you would expect investment and, and funding into that to be somewhat proportional, not necessarily 100% true because uh, uh, some systems, obviously, like nuclear, you would want to, you pr could get more bang for your buck if you see fast um, uh, rates, uh, learning rates. Um, but as like a general sentiment, I would, I would say it should be approximately proportional to that. Um, and so like really the answer is like, I would say 5%, you would say 20%. Um, um, I, I would be more than happy to concede the 20% point to let nuclear have a better chance, uh, than it, mm. uh, currently has been having. So. I, I understand sort of like your bias towards LCOE. It's 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 probably where you work in terms of, you know, systems installed, who's buying what, how we can balance the grid. But that doesn't take into account the final opportunity cost at 60%. So once you get to 60%, your value per installed kilowatt of solar is going to be massively lower. You're going to be capped out during the day. You're going to have to have really great inverters, lots of storage. You're going to have to have contracts that let you be flexible, and maybe some like off takers for those for that peak energy. And that's that's not a really popular position to be in when you're 
literally giving energy away for free so that you don't damage your systems. Yeah. And so the, the incremental value at 60%, at 80%, that's what your LCOE needs to be based on. So I would say investment should not be proportional. It should be proportional based on your final target price. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's probably um, a, a better way to put it. I think you're kind of talking about the duck curve here. Um, we don't have all, like, to some degree. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and I would say uh, the data that you provided me was California uh, 29, or like, it might have been 2015 all the way to 2023. Um, the data coming out of 2024 now is starting to look much, much better. Um, and yeah, um, again, really? we're, we're, we're only halfway through the year, um, but you can look up, uh, uh, I think it's called Grid Power on Twitter. Uh, and they've shown okay. shown the duck curve since, and it started to flatten due to this um, increase of battery storage systems uh, in the um, uh, basically into their into their system. So seeing this huge investment into battery storage, seeing how we're kind of just at the bottom end on where battery storage systems are going to take a humongous uptick. Um, again, if I'm at a roulette table. Uh, batteries seem to be uh, kind of betting on black, uh, as it were, uh, just because, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, I got to say, like, watch out for that data, because remember, we're in a La Nina cycle. I'm not going to go, uh, you know, Milinkovic on you right now, yeah. but year-to-year uh, -year data, when you are having a, a indicator, a climate indicator in the wrong direction, you got to account for that. So let's let's be a little careful on predictions that batteries are great because it's cooler this spring than it was last spring. Yeah, I, th that's that's fair. But um, the there seems to be a pretty dramatic difference between 2023 and 2024. Even if it's not the full delta, uh, it seems to have done uh, batteries a pretty good job of that. And seeing as how we're expecting almost an eight time increase in total batteries installed. Uh, by 2030, um, I think it's um, uh, at least yeah. cautiously safe to say they're they're gonna they're gonna have a really influential impact on that. Um, yeah, like <laughs> um, like I said, the more that I I read into this, and the more we did this thing, um, uh, the more that I saw we uh, agree on much more than uh, probably either of us thought when we first uh, shit talked each other. Two or three months ago. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. I am so glad you brought that up. So yep. you put out a video. Yep. You put out a video that said I that that I was living no that you were living rent free in my head. No, no. I said but, you yet yeah, you were living rent free in my head. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because no, it, it you I, seem to imply that I was being unhinged oh, rather no. than you No no, I, I was implying that I okay. I'm unhinged on Twitter. No, no. Right, right. Because because when you, after we had like a, a nice little uh, introductory where where I cited the use the proper use of LCOE as the next incremental cost of investment, and that triggered you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, then you but you liberal you, you got <laughs> you got on my timeline and jumped into a thread where I was arguing with German anti nuclear people that thought the electricity map app had a bias and was hiding data from us. Yeah, I was literally just talking shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, like I said, you, you were living rent-free in my head. Um, yeah. All right, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, sorry if that was, uh, that was a misunderstanding. Yeah, I was, I, I was being like, yeah, like, <laughs> my, my Twitter's fucked. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, Twitter does that to you. Uh, so I forgive you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. But I, I also, you know, it's I, you. You did <laughs> you did an impeccable job of making me like you, and it 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 almost <laughs> pissed me off. Uh... <laughs> uh... Great. Well, now that we've got all of that, um, Leith, you had some excellent questions. I think we we can, uh, unless we want to do a closing, or or do we want to maybe save the closing till after the questions? Well, there were a couple of questions. Uh, we can get a closing like directly after just a couple of questions. Uh, one of the first questions was, uh, how do we give more? Uh, ooh, what would the word be? 
how do we give more guarantees that something like Fukushima won't happen again to make investors want to invest in nuclear energy? Okay, I'm gonna jump right in because um, I got this one on lock. Uh, I, I actually I actually work uh, with uh, Reed Tanaka, who I previously um, and before either of us worked um, at TerraPower. Uh, Reed was a first responder uh, at, at uh, Fukushima. He was on the USS Reagan when his radiation sensors went off, and uh, so he was a part of the relief the relief effort there. And then later, the U.S. Navy engaged him as comms because he was expert in communications and about to retire uh, uh, on nuclear. And so he was able to properly inform service members about uh, their risks uh, if they if they were staying. Uh, and he basically was there to convince them to stay, but he was happy to stay. Uh, it was, um, he, he has this great chart where your Tokyo Joe and your Fukushima Joe have lower radiation risks than anyone who smokes and smoking is extremely popular in japan the the sole case of a nuclear injury claim a radiation injury claim in japan came from an older gentleman did smoke uh i'm not going to argue against you know him getting compensated for being a nuclear worker but the fact is is that this is not a uh this is not a determinative evidential cause of his lung cancer it is an if not but for legalistic claim getting that out of the way uh following fukushima daiichi and that's the proper way to refer to it um fukushima is like a giant prefecture like new jersey uh so call it fukushima daiichi nuclear disaster ignore the sussex.edu misinformation you can look and on google and see what i'm talking about thanks google for showing a fossil fuel explosion instead of a nuclear explosion uh <laughs> I'm I'm hot about that. By the way, uh, super disinfo coming from Sussex, UK, in many regards. Do not endorse their coverage of this topic. They have not responded to my criticisms. I'm very angry with them. So, following that incident, Fukushima Daiichi, the US, EU, everywhere in the West, for sure, and I hope China, too, uh, conducted a beyond-design basis evaluation. They made plans for really silly things like, are we going to have a forklift driver available on the weekend? <laughs> and all sorts of disaster relief plans. Not only that, but there were a cascade of misadventures that led Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi and Daini to be at risk. And the good news there is that we had three plants melt down a release so small that people have returned to the region that no-go zone has shrunk basically very close to the plant boundary. I can't say for sure that it's all the way there, but but you look at things like the SafeCast map and the historic high levels do not match the current levels. The current monitoring station levels do not match this red blob that you get from looking at Fukushima um, the Name on the map there. So Fukushima wasn't nearly as bad as uh, Chernobyl. It's still something that we need to avoid, and I think the EU program, uh, the U.S. program, and as well the uh, risk-informed licensing are all the correct thing to do in order to help us avoid that while we use nuclear energy to pursue our climate goals. Awesome. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I would. Uh, I I made a video um, where I praise nuclear as as one of the the things as I went through. Um, and I think it's really important to put into the context of like likelihood of death when we're looking at these things, it's, uh, near negligible. Like I have to fly a lot for my work. Uh, I still think that I'm going to die every time I get on a plane and that it's going to crash. Uh, even though, uh, I'm far more likely to die, you know, when I go cycling or when I drive a car or anything like this and, and getting these like order of magnitude understandings of like what risks are. Uh, our kind of monkey brains of this thing blew up or this thing was bad um, is is kind of always always ringing versus um, probabilities, which humans tend to be really, really bad at conceptualizing. Uh, so you're much more likely to die of, you know, just having too much cholesterol in your system <laughs> than you ever will be to um, die from a nuclear um, reactor. And coal plants um, produce far more radiation than nuclear reactors do. Um, 
so I I'd step back from that, but they do they do they do produce more radiation to the general public yeah. because of that that granite effluence, especially when you have a big spill like Kingston, Tennessee, where all of the coal ash, which does have natural uranium in it, flooded into the river. Um, not so much a big deal, but really it is it is those fission products we need to worry about. Uh, I, I know like Michael Schellenberger loves to talk about coal actually produces more. It, it's in fact, and this is ironic, this is sort of a right-wing talking point. So be careful about deploying that one. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it, like we're talking about micro sievers here. That doesn't always have the total context, obviously. But yes. Right, yeah. right. And it's more likely the metals, the heavy metals in that coal ash. That is the big cancer risk. Yeah. Got to avoid those. And clean coal so, just means they- low sulfur. <laughs> It's not a real thing. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. didn't want to say those words, but uh, yeah, leaving clean, clean coal, coal out of this. Yeah, <laughs> clean coal is why we stopped doing coal in Appalachia. In, in, we stopped digging it in Appalachia, and we moved all the jobs to more automated, more heavy mining in the West Coast because it's lower sulfur. Yep. Easy, just, just different. So the next question I was going to ask, and you were mentioning about how China is able to get nuclear energy and uh, set up their infrastructure for nuclear energy. Can we, like being that we haven't reached the price point for nuclear energy in the West that China is working toward, can we afford not to try to move faster considering the setbacks that we've had in trying to get nuclear energy in the, in the Western world? D, D, why don't you uh, why don't you go first? I, I actually think we're going to agree a lot on this one. Yeah, like like I said, like I, I think uh, it's really important, and to me, it feels like every year that we don't invest in nuclear, it gets further and further away, and that that gap it gets worse and worse. Like I said, if if this debate was happening in two thousand, me uh, me and Carl would be exactly on the same side, fighting the same position. And at every year that. Um, Th- that outcome gets further and further away. So um, the faster that we can get through some of this nonsense, and hopefully the reactors in Ontario uh, help kind of kickstart that and, and give uh, the states some, um, some, uh, I guess, oomph <laughs> and like ability to to um, to, to take what what we're we're doing. Uh, but I also fear that if there's another, uh, dare I say, fuck up like Vogel, that that could dramatically reduce the the likelihood of, of nuclear being um being uptaken so yeah. yeah what what will absolutely put a big damper on nuclear investment would be a fuck up in china <laughs> and i have i have interviewed us regulators on my program on the eco modernist channel about the risks of a opaque regulatory system like China has. I, I'm very proud that the NRC is a transparent system, uh, almost too transparent. It would be like if the FAA stopped advocating for expanding the U.S. airline fleet. <laughs> that That is what kind of regulator we have. Uh, I do not disparage them. I say they are a great, wonderful, very safe regulator that is currently innovating on the in the realm of um, of permitting. Uh, but it is not within the NRC's core mission, uh, as I understand it, to promote the expansion and export of U.S. nuclear technology. Again, you can check out the channel, Equimonitor's channel, especially with Daniel Chen. Daniel has much, much harsher words than I do for the U.S. nuclear export regime. I wish that Daniel's vision uh, was carried out and we we get a little better international competition so that you know china and russia aren't ca- aren't carving up africa that that the us gets involved in the development program so that we have safer more transparent regulation around the world are you are you in favor of globalism no i'm just <laughs> absolutely it's it's um dare i say dare, no i mean i could meme i could meme and say i'm a uh, a, a 
I, a national social. Ooh, that's that's not a good one. No, 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 ooh, no, 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 no I don't no. like those two words. <laughs> no, but but if we have a national mission, it could be a liberal national mission that values all people. And as long as we have this mission to spread the good things in America globally, I'm all for it. Awesome answers. I think that helps out a lot for people to understand the need that we have to try to keep pace with China because China is able to do things a lot more rapidly than we do with our politics the way we have them, where they can just say, we're going green tomorrow and they're going green tomorrow collectively. So yeah, that's a great bit of information. So I guess uh, with that, uh, the only other question I could have asked would be about batteries. And uh, I think you mostly answered the questions when it came down to batteries, because we're building the plant in Texas. Yep. So that about covers that. No, no. I want to. I want to nail this one. I want to nail this one. D. Okay. Uh, w where? Where are we going to get terawatt hours of grid storage? In the in the sense of like, um, like whether we can do it or not. Because if it, if well, it's like, yeah. like like at a because right now four hours is cost competitive, right? Right. And so um, are you you're talking because there, there's certain sectors that are like, no, we need 28 days of storage. We need 90 days of storage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about the four hour? Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, I would say, I, even the 12 hour case, <laughs> um, I would say that generally speaking, the 28 day case like this gets into cost optimization where um, I don't think unless your batteries are a dollar a kilowatt hour uh there probably isn't a cost optimization that that's just like you can take any model to to infinity um i i don't see the 28 day case ever existing and that gets truly into the argument between transmission and batteries where if you're a place like germany and you don't want to interconnect or you're a place like texas and you don't want to interconnect or even alberta and you don't want to interconnect because daniel smith wants to um be a sovereign nation that's in the middle of the continental uh <laughs> north america um see how that goes but um then uh i'm right there with you where we're looking at a 25 percent nuclear case probably with um if you want to maintain the four hours of battery storage which is cost competitive that's with nmc um it seems like lfp batteries uh, are even cheaper than that and then sodium ions uh we'll have to see where it comes down to but its physical material costs are much cheaper uh, being mostly like Prussian mm -hmm. blue and sodium and graphite. Uh, the advent of silicon anodes um, is probably more on the side of cars than anything because you get really fast charging times um, with the technology on, in that space. So um, range anxiety becomes less of an issue uh, if you have a six to 10 minute uh, charge time. Um, and then with sodium, or then with uh, iron air batteries, uh, that's probably where you would see the largest storage. Though their um, uh, their uh, full charge, like like cycle efficiency, is uh, quite low at the moment, being in the thirty to fifty percent mm -hmm. rather than the eighty to ninety percent with LFPs and and lithium ion batteries. Uh, but we're looking at storage cases uh, and examples that should come out, like I said, in the next couple of years of 10 megawatt and 100 megawatt hour um, um, iron air batteries. Uh, I believe out of Minnesota is where the first one is going to be. And then I think there's two more um, that uh, look like they're going to come down the pipeline. So. What's your what's your opinion on um, you know sort of older technologies? We're talking like deep cycle lead batteries. It, do those just not scale? Is it risk of uh, materials? Is it something else? So lead batteries are like, I believe they're forty um, forty kilowatt hour per kilo. So like extraordinarily low energy density. I think they have relatively poor cycle efficiency as well. Uh, and you get the issue of it being a lead acid battery. So you might be able to make an argument of like taking old car batteries and then turning it into a battery storage system, something like that. I've, I've heard that stuff go around, but I haven't seen any real economics on it. Um, I imagine it's 
it would probably just fail to lithium ion because although like space isn't as big a deal with battery storage solutions, it's still to some degree is. And if you can get better energy density versus lower energy density, that's going to be um, better. Obviously, that makes the case um, <laughs> in part for nuclear. I know you're going to jump right on that. But uh, like I said, the cost of land is included in, in these cost estimations. Um, that's, that's amazing because the last time I saw a... So this, the Dunkel Flauta, the two week period of low wind and sun in the winter, uh, if you apply that problem to battery storage in Washington state, you take the, or sorry, just Seattle, just mm -hmm. Seattle, you take our biggest, biggest building downtown, you make four copies of it and you fill it with lithium ion batteries. And there's your storage solution for two weeks of storage. Of course, this is going back to like the the, the four hours versus mm -hmm. twenty eight days case, yeah. and I'm glad that we're we're pretty much on the same page now when it comes to that. Yeah, no, twenty eight days is insane, um, and uh, it, like the mineral demand is is through the roof. Uh, with four hours uh, now, all your mineral demand is shifted towards cars, and then you'll see me making the uh, the, uh, the the lefty argument for uh, trains and transit and walkable cities. <laughs> i love it i love it trains trains are the nuclear power of the grid bicycles are the wind and solar and it just works so much better when they're working together <laughs> sounds like a great setup so there is a question from the chat about the newer sodium batteries as a supplement slash replacement to the lif or live lfp, you know, LFP versus lithium ion yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just like generally about it? Yes, they were asking uh, about that as a replacement or a supplement to the lithium ion batteries. Um, yeah, I mean, right now the energy density is lower. I think it's 160 kilo per kilowatt hour versus like 250, 300 uh, for lithium ions. So that's obviously going to give you more range anxiety. That means a lot less. Like I said, if you can shift to the silicon anodes that can charge a lot faster. Um, but Again, we, we get into different areas, whether it's vehicles, like electric vehicles or electric storage, where storage, the kilo per kilowatt hour is a lot less meaningful because you're not moving the thing. So um, I see it starting in the storage space and then possibly moving into the, um, the vehicle space if it's cheaper. I know China is already making sodium ion battery um, vehicles. So, uh, but those are kind of like in line with the LFP ones where your range is in the order of like 80 to hundred kilometers, or I don't know what that is in freedom units off the top of my head, but, uh, <laughs> 80 to hundred, that's not very far. That's, nope. um, 35 miles. I'm I, no, no. Yeah. It's a hundred is 60. I know that. Yeah, Cause that's okay. speeding. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah. it's 60 so, miles top end. Yeah. So, so that, that's a thing of like, um, it's, it's fine for like a, a city vehicle. Um, and since most people's commutes are 15 kilometers or less, generally speaking, uh, even here in Canada, even when it's cold, electric vehicles are perfectly fine for those cases. And like I said, if you have a grid network with, um, the silicon anodes, then your range anxiety pretty much goes away. Um, uh, yeah. Amazing. That is great to hear. You guys gave me some hope for my vehicle because I was about to get in on a class action suit for my uh, Toyota hydrogen vehicle. And hearing that the nuclear expansion that we have may make hydrogen more available in the future does my heart some good. Because going from can't... 18 to $36 <laughs> per uh, kilo is brutal. You know what? If, if you're going to bet on that... Um... Uh, you're going to have to move to San Luis Obispo where Diablo Canyon is <laughs> because storage and transfer of, of uh, hydrogen is, is not simple. It's it is. There. Yeah, it is uh, not simple. Oh, yeah. do, do I have this right? Um, yeah. San Luis Obispo is, is where you got to move if you want a hydrogen car. Mm -hmm. So I got to move to the boobies just to make sure I get my hydrogen. <laughs> well, uh, you can move yeah, to Vancouver. Assuming it's nuclear. You oh, can move there you go. Vancouver, I believe the hydrogen is 12 to $15 a kilo. Um, and, and what's the sourcing for that? Uh, I, th I think it's green hydrogen. 
uh, but I it also could be quite <laughs> subsidized. So um, it it could also be one percent, and this is the big scandal of oh, Green Planet okay. Energy, former formerly known as Greenpeace Energy. Literally, Greenpeace Energy was selling ninety nine percent fossil hydrogen. Big problem. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. I know the unit cost for um, green hydrogen is in the five to seven dollar range, and then for nuclear, it's kind of the two to three, uh, uh, d depending. But yeah, the high temperature steam electrolysis is so much more efficient for um, for hydrogen production than just uh, normal electrolysis. So that's where nuclear has a big leg up. This is where I told um, Carl that like I feel like that uh, if I was a nuclear power company, I would be going that direction uh, and saying, hey, we're not a power company, we're a hydrogen company, we're building hydrogen for the future, we need a hydrogen economy, we clearly need fertilizers, we clearly need all these things, hydrogen powered vehicles, uh, whatever it might be, and going down that route rather than competing directly with electrical systems, I feel like gives nuclear its best chance of success. And let me, let me back off. So I don't know if you've seen this, because I have a lot of content on my channel, um, I, I had an interview with G.K. Shriya Prakash about synthetic fuels in general, and it, he advocates for not hydrogen directly, uh, but methanol. It is uh, a little easier to store and transport. It is a very, very small step down in efficiency to get to methanol from hydrogen out of seawater because you've got so many uh, hydrocarbon possibilities there already. Uh, it's, it's absolutely the case to be made. Uh, there's another case for ammonia yep. with all the great uh, nitrogen fixing needs that we're going to have. Uh, ammonia and ammonia sourced from clean uh, nuclear or renewable energy is a absolute killer product. Uh, and so I really hope that both of those fellows who each advocate for different alternative uh, clean fuels are, are making progress. Yeah. Yeah. And it, awesome. Next time I get a uh, alternative fuel vehicle, I will speak to you gentlemen first, please. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, um, ammonia uh, I'm more familiar with on, on this, this side, but um, uh, yeah, just because we already have the infrastructure for ammonia, it makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously ammonia is pretty toxic, um, but so is a lot of things uh, that we deal with. And that's why we have regulations and institutions to make sure that it's properly maintained. But um, you also lose obviously efficiency of going from hydrogen, well, going from water to hydrogen to ammonia back to hydrogen. I think the round trip efficiency for hydrogen vehicles is you're putting in about 50 to 60, um, kilowatt hours of power and you're getting about 15 kilowatt hours out. Um, uh, and with the total theoretical hydrogen, uh, energy output being 32. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have any further questions coming from the chat. You guys have been awesome. This has been a great chat you guys have had. So I wanted to see if you guys wanted to get a close out. Sure. Okay. okay. With you. With I, you, yeah, well, I, I took the um I took the initiative, so I will let D have the last word. Best debate ever. Let's go. <laughs> I it it hasn't been a debate. No, I'm not, I'm not going to dance on D's grave, but we have we have done our job here. We have uh, done a good good amount of work convincing someone who had an initial feeling that nuclear was a right wing talking point, and that's where we started. I I think that coming around to nuclear as a part of a future decarbonized grid, uh, I'm very proud to say that you've come a long way, D. <laughs> And I'm very happy that you are now living up to your name, <laughs> advocating for a two time for a 100% increase in nuclear capacity. I would, of course, like it more, but I think that 100% increase is a is a really good first step. Hopefully, we get there as soon as possible. Was that your closing statement? That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think I agree. I think I I have a. A willingness to like have my change my my mind change, especially on this. I think I started off um, extraordinarily pro nuclear um, when I was younger, uh, and then got a little bit uh, uh, disenchanted by it. Uh, talking to Canadian nuclear specialists, 
and being like, hey, I really want to work in this industry. And they basically told me to uh, uh, do something else. <laughs> uh, you're wasting your time. Um, and, um, um, and then, so I see it a little bit more as like a, a U curve, uh, as it were. Um, but again, uh, I'm still uh, probably a little bit on the fence of like, I, we need to see some, some proof in the pudding of it. Uh, but I really hope nuclear is successful. I, I truly do. Um, but I think cost optimization is a really important aspect. And um, at least for right now, we need to be putting tons and tons of resources into transmission and batteries and solar and all of these things. And if the true limit is 70%, 80%, 90%, um, it's going to take us a little while to get there, uh, nevertheless. Um, But like I said, I fear that advancements in that technology, things like iron air batteries that get more efficient that could hold storage for in the seven day case and then you can transmit energy long distances would make wherever nuclear does sit uneconomic and then just kind of um unfortunately t- tossed out i don't know what'll happen and i can't predict the future um but uh yeah that's kind of where i'm at i still think that like you said a uh, doubling of our existing nuclear fleet uh, is is probably the um, where I expect it to go, um, and you think about a four hundred percent increase, I believe. <laughs> Give or take four hundred would be amazing. I know that we've committed in um, in C- in the latest COP in Dubai, n- several nations committed to a, f- a a tripling of current nuclear capacity. If I understand it, maybe it was maybe it was four times. I, was it three hundred percent increase, or was it a I'm not, I'm three not sure. times? Like most, I don't know. Most, most pro estimates I see have nu- has nuclear being about ten percent of energy demands. Um, oh, that is that is so conservative. That is so conservative, but it is practical conservative. I would love to see twenty five percent by twenty fifty, and that's and that's the real target is twenty fifty. Yeah. So yeah, I, and again, the way that I see it is it depends entirely on those costs uh, in terms of LCOE. That's for and. We should have clarified this for renewables. There's multiple things you have to include in the LCOE to make it competitive. You have to include batteries. So um, LCOB or, or LCOS, levelized cost of storage, then transmission, levelized cost of transmission, and then levelized cost of energy. And all that gets packaged and then still called levelized cost of energy. So <laughs> um, the terms and the the jargon can get a little bit frustrating to uh, to sift through because it uh, can mean multiple different things. Um, so, yeah. Well, you both have been amazing interlocutors. I've appreciated listening to this conversation. There wasn't a great deal I could ask except for a few questions from the chat, and you guys knocked those right out of the park. So uh, if anybody needs a dip, uh, by all means, it's been great having you. Dungeons, Deadlifts, and Decarbonization. And Soyato, you've been awesome. Follow these two great individuals to hear more of this information in the future. Awesome. And uh, yeah. so somebody from the chat wanted to pop in who was very interested in uh, most of the takes that were going on and may have some more in-depth questions oh, if you stick yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Awesome. Let's do it. I'm going to close down my stream and uh, raid everyone over here, though. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Ancom. Hello, hello. So um, I came on primarily just because um, I know Carl is going to have a lot more background information just there in his head um, about specifically Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, So there were a lot of claims made by ex-Testy Johnson in, uh, in chat near the beginning of this um and a lot of them i just hadn't heard so i don't really have good responses to them um so one of the biggest ones i think was the claim that the japanese government has been lying about the background radiation levels found uh in and around the fukushima in fukushima daiichi plant um in the in the years following the for the raid um, and the other was the fact that, or the claim that they plan to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they plan to be dumping contaminated water into the ocean for the next 30 years, uh, and that they have so much of it currently stored that 
they were trying to sell to China and China has has stopped buying that. Um, my understanding is the decontamination de process for the water um, that's being released is pretty thorough. Um, one of the claims was they, they can't get rid of everything, but that's just kind of true of everything because background radiation levels exist. Um, so that's where I kind of uh, stood on it. But if you have any additional background information on those claims, I would love to uh, to learn. I would I would love to argue with a proxy for Dana Dernford, the man who was under house arrest for years <laughs> for harassing Jay Cullen about his Fukushima Daiichi studies. Uh, Jay is a Canadian scientist who sampled uh, the cesium radiation, the cesium contamination in fish. And uh, Dernford and other horrible people uh, like him uh, caused a great deal of stress, uh, threatened, um, threatened this scientist, uh, and do enormous discredit to the anti-nuclear movement for being just so unhinged. Mm. Only slightly less unhinged are these claims that Japan is faking the data and they're uh, unable to sell water. No, they're unable to sell fish, and this is for political reasons, because China's in a trade war with everyone now. Ah, uh, yes. They, they want Japan to make no claims, no territorial claims, uh, to, to the oceans around them, to especially uh, near Taiwan, near the South China Sea, the nine dash line. So yes, they're going to do everything they can to elicit a reaction from Japan. Now, when it comes to actual problems, show us the data. Where's the data? If Japan was dumping actually dangerous contamination into the ocean, one of these great, well, well-funded anti-nuclear organizations, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, Billions and billions of dollars flow into these organizations. Why can't they give us actual data about these alleged misdeeds? I would love to see it. You can go on safecast.org, look at the map, look at the listening stations, publicly available data. You see a big, you know, blotchy, scary red area. That's, that's Name area, Fukushima Daiichi area. But if you click on the actual listening stations, the data is, is lower than the map indicates because the data the listing station data is current and that is traceable and publicly transparent that's what we want out of a nuclear industry so one of the when when i was trying to research those claims myself i did come across one article um, that i skimmed a little bit which seemed to be talking about the uh, the various monitoring sites that japan has set up in the region to keep an eye on radiation levels but there were some concerns it looked like that these uh stations were strategically planted to avoid uh, the hot spots and also that they uh they only measure for gamma radiation and not alpha and beta particles just curious if you have any insight on that Okay, I'll absolutely uh, give you the the right information. Is that uh, gamma detectors uh, are easy and cheap? Fair. This is a gamma detector. It cost me about a hundred dollars on Amazon. A alpha beta would have a shield over the back that I have to open up to expose the sensor directly. It's more fragile. It's more prone to damage. It costs about five times as much, maybe maybe a little less now. But uh, you know. The, these are scare tactics, really, uh, to say that, oh, they're only measuring gammas. The, the gammas and the energies output by gamma will tell you exactly what isotope you're encountering. There's no need to gather alphas and betas because alphas, betas, gammas, those are like, those are the signals of the contamination telling on itself. Those don't need to be individually monitored. You just need to know the energy of the gammas. So that you then know, oh, this is a nothing burger. It's uranium, or it's more likely tritium, or oh no, that's a really high energy. That could that could be cesium, or worse, plutonium. That's what you got to watch out for. And I think that these sensors are calibrated correctly against gamma 
to give us the risk to humans. We don't need to know that the piles of contaminated soil or the tanks of water are a hot zone. We already know those are hot zones. That's not where people are going to be going. The monitoring stations are for public health, not to scare people. That's why we need them. Fair enough. Thank you very much for uh, addressing that so comprehensively. I have, I think, a greater than average background knowledge on a lot of the, the nuclear stuff going on, largely because uh, I've been in your proximity for a few years now. But to have someone who focuses on this so uh, so dramatically kind of just be able to address these things uh, so quickly and efficiently is is. Uh, just a really nice resource so thank you very much for for that awesome thanks sean kevin but that's okay <laughs> oh god i i mixed wrong, up wrong uh, one that's okay oh. <laughs> and calm either way good team works. good good stream there we go yeah, that is great uh, so you don't have to worry about three dot uh three-eyed simpsons fishes coming out of <sighs> The Japanese waters. I mean, to it's be fair, alive. that would make some amazing sushi. Okay, it let's would. Be real it here. would. Will, Will Shekel from Austria, from Nuclear for Australia, he, he actually traveled uh, around to nuclear plants asking him if they had any three eyed fish. I, I don't know why he couldn't find any. <laughs> I, see, I get the feeling that we could probably do three eyed fish without any radiation. Just, you know, I, called, I'm sure that there is that. It's I'm sure selenium. fish eggs must hate. <laughs> I'm sure fish <laughs> eggs must occasionally like go partially dizygotic and and create like you know the Siamese twins of fishes. I'm sure they're out there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, look at uh, look at selenium mine runoff or uh, coal mine runoff with selenium. Uh, it causes birth Ooh. defects in fish. Yep. Uh, yep. Don't need nuclear for that. Just just go to a coal power plant. You'll be fine. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Oh boy. Second appearance yeah. of good clean coal. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. This is this is something I haven't looked super into and I feel it, like it seems like a buzzword, but is clean coal just supposed to be coal with some form of carbon capture or no. is there something else to it that I don't know about? Low no sulfur. So yeah, low so back back in the 90s when I was learning yeah. about environment, yeah, we learned about acid rain. All the all the birds had thin um, thinning egg walls. They were dying off, and the the sulfur was the problem. It is, despite right wing talking points, it was a policy success. Uh, I think that you know we 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 generally eliminated the production of high sulfur coal. Uh, unfortunately, that meant a lot of jobs fled the Rocky Mountain area. But also, I guess the jobs fled because they were unionizing. So there's it, wait. It's, do you mean, it, did you mean to say the Appalachian Appalachian Mountain area? I thought that's where right. most coal came from. You said Rocky, uh, so used to you, yeah, the Rocky Mountain. Oh, okay. uh, sorry, the Rocky Mountain is the current source. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So okay, I didn't realize it, it was just the low sulfur because I remember, you know, back in the '90s when you know the fears of acid rain were even getting into like kid shows that you know looked at like did you know futuristic um, show or like episodes and whatnot. They would always talk about pH levels of the rain uh, and talk about acid rain. But I always thought that that was more due to carbonic acid with high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Didn't realize that it was so heavily focused on sulfuric acid. Yeah. yeah. That is awesome. that is it's like acutely acidic. The, the carbonic acid is a different problem. We can get into the crazy uh, global pH level where phytoplankton are going to start dying and cause our yeah. our climate system to swing wildly out of control. D, why don't you why don't you horrify some people if you know it? Yeah, it's I mean, yeah, carbonic acid is just a weak acid um versus sulfuric being a strong acid. Uh so full association versus partial. Um but uh, uh I don't know what the actual pH level is, but yeah, it's basically like you have things like coral which are essentially just um uh limestone like it, it, it's a base interacting with an acid and the more acid we put in our ocean the more that it reacts with bases yeah there you go <laughs> right, right right in here 
uh, an increase in temperature past 1.5 means that we go from 90% coral die-offs to 99.9% .9 coral die-offs. Ooh. Oof. Yep. And yeah. And that is a that is a very well-worn copy of an IPCC report. How recent is that one? I'm curious. This is my favorite, my very favorite. It's the special report on 1.5 degrees. It is the last time the IPCC dared to publish scenario strategies for decarbonization. Oh. Not just in not just in dollars and cents like the latest AR6 did, but full decarbonization strategies. And the nuke bros love this because it says nuclear relative to 2010 500% increase. <laughs> or so 500%, so, so a 5 times or 400% increase. Yeah. So we, need, we would need to quintuple our global nuclear energy output in order to uh, meet that yep. goal, which, you know, basically That's... just just <laughs> multiply France like 10 times and we'd be covered. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I mean, France is not that many people in the global scheme. <laughs> true, w true. W France. <laughs> All right. Well, I promised my daughter oh. I'm going to go. So, D, okay. wonderful speaking with you again. Uh, we will hang out. Uh, you can check out my channel again, Eco Modernist Channel or Eco Modernist One on YouTube. I will have dungeons, deadlifts, and decarbonization on my channel, and we will talk about the future, the glorious future of solar and battery storage. Because hey, if it happens, I'm here for it, and I want to get the good news and spread it because nuclear and renewables must work together in the future. Fantastic. Yeah, 100%. Whenever we can make that thank happen. Thank you for being here, Carl. <laughs> Always great to see you, and thank you for uh, having this here. I think awesome. Thank you. Chat enjoyed it greatly. We got educated on a Sunday. Let's go. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and raise... Hey, Sunday, Sunday is the best days for education. <laughs> And great meeting you, Dungeons, Deadlifts, and Decarbonization. That is a mouthful, but uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't think about that when I made made the channel. That was a that was a D cube. D D and D is fine. Yeah, um, I don't know if you. Is good. Yeah, I don't know if you guys ever watched Critical Role, but um, Travis came on with a shirt that said Dungeons Dead or Dungeons Dragons and Deadlifts, and that's what the the play on words. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was a big fan of Scanlan. <laughs> me too me too uh i'm excited for the mighty nine season when that comes out but uh yeah seems good yeah i'll be down for it and stop in the stream Perfect. send everybody to universal discourse so they can get a different kind of education <laughs> indeed good stuff all right